are live. Hey, everybody, and welcome to Chef AJ Live. I'm your host, Chef AJ, and this is where I introduce you to amazing people like you who are doing great things in the world that I think you should know about. Today, we have one of our most popular guests. Her name is Dr. Jen Hawk. She is half of the dynamic duo of the unbelievably popular and wonderful Beat Your Genes podcast. She's here today solo. Sometimes she comes on with Dr. Lyle, sometimes he comes on without her, but we have her all to ourselves today. Please welcome Dr. Jen Hawk. It's always so nice to see you. Oh, it's great to be here. How's it going? It's good. Well, I feel like I just saw you yesterday because I joined your virtual village, which if you like, you can talk oh. about, which is really nice. It's a it's a really kind of fun thing that you do now. If you want to tell people yeah. about it. Oh, sure. Yeah. If people are interested in that, that's a that's a monthly, um, well, it's actually, I think I'm going to move it to just kind of an ongoing thing so people can just sign up and they can come and go as they like. But it's um, every, right now it's every Sunday, might be moving to Saturdays in April. Um, March is full. So, so I can't take any more registrations for the month of March. But if people People are interested in in joining for um, April and going forward. It's basically it's a it's a weekly kind of anything goes live stream chat with me and and a group of folks who are interested in all things evolutionary psychology and pleasure trap and um, you know we just talk about a bunch of stuff. I mean, if you were there last night, you know that we. We, we talked about the role of religion in evolutionary psychology. We, we talked about all kinds of hot button stuff. So it was, it was quite, a, um, quite a rollicking session yesterday. So it's really just, it's kind of part group therapy, part Q and A, um, just part, it's, I really thought of it as um, replacing the Stone Age village. You know, it's sort of, let's all gather around the campfire once a week and just talk about what we're going through, share some wisdom. Um, so it's really just kind of a fun Zoom community if people want to join that. They can, they can find links for how to, how to do that on my website, jenhawk.com. Um, and it's a, a going forward into April, it'll be a Patreon benefit for, um, for people if they want to subscribe that way. So, um, but you can find all the details at jenhawk.com. Okay. Well, I think if you need another name, you can call it Hawk Talk. Yeah, <laughs> yeah definitely. It is. It is. Uh, but, you know, I try not to, it, I try not to make it too much about me and that it is kind of the group and everybody sharing, but it does a lot of it just because people are curious about evolutionary ideas. Um, it always, I, there, it, we do do a fair amount of Q&A. So it's, it's just kind of, it's a little different every week and it really is all about who's there and what they want to talk about. And you did that wonderful three-part webinar series with Dr. Lyle and Dr. Gregor, and people can still get the replay on your website if they like. Yeah, that, that recording is available on my website too. If people missed it and they just want to want to snap that up, they can get that at jenhawk.com too. Yeah, that was a good one. Well, Angela says, mm -hmm. it's really wonderful being a member of the virtual village. It's so helpful. Stephanie says, I love Dr. Hawk. I was just binge watching a Steam Dynamics in the member video section. If you're going to binge, that's the kind of binge we recommend. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And, and talk about the member center, because I mean, it, it, the thing is, is it's so the price is so low, I think people won't believe it. It's like $99 for like the rest. Of, is it the rest of my life or the rest of your life or whatever comes first? Yeah, I, I guess it's the rest of Yeah, whichever comes first, probably. <laughs> but it's a lifetime membership for $99. Um, the thing about the lifetime membership for this is the the sort of um, membership site that Dr. Lyle and I have together. So just to keep people very confused, I have my website, jenhawk.com, where I have all of my offerings and all the stuff that I kind of do. Um, not everything I do is a collaboration with, with Dr. Lyle, although a lot of it is. So the, the main thing that we work on together is the Esteem Dynamics website, and particularly what we call the, the Living Wisdom Library, which is this compendium of everything that we know about evolutionary psychology and how to apply it to daily life. You know, he really is the first evolutionary psychology clinician in, in the world, as far as I know, who has taken these ideas and applied them to real life problems in a really systematic way. So he and I together have built the site. We have quite a bit of members only content, including a, a four hour uh, tour de force of, of self-esteem and of the history of psychology and um, uh, personality and what personality really is and the behavioral genetics of it. Uh, and that is um, the human nature series, which is only available in our members section. So you can sign up annually for $20 $29, um, or you can do a lifetime for 99 and you can also pay the 99 in three installments if that's more convenient for you. The, the real benefit of the $99 lifetime membership is that puts you on the list for access to our book when we finish our book. We, we've gotten somewhat derailed as most of the world has by COVID. Um, so we're running a little behind schedule. We weren't able to get as much work done this year as we were hoping. Um, we've been ships in the night sort of passing each other, but we made a lot of progress in the last couple of months and, and we're looking forward to having that book out um, hopefully you know, before the year is out. So um, if you're interested in getting a copy of our book, which is sort of like part textbook on evolutionary psychology, 
part uh, self-help book and you know really let's let, let's apply these ideas how can I how can I think of evolutionary psychology in ways that are really relevant for uh, personal happiness and relationships and jobs and family and all of the things that we talk about um, so that's that that will be available for folks and the, the, the website is the only way to get that book that is we are we're we're uh, we're not making it available elsewhere. So if you're interested in getting on that list, you, you, it's the lifetime membership is currently the only way to get the book. Wow. Well, everybody's asking when it's coming out. Yeah, I don't want to commit to a date because this is a collaborative process. And, and we're also, it's not entirely up to us because even though we are self-publishing, we are, um, we're sending it out to a lot of advanced readers and people who are going to give us feedback. So we, we can only police that timeline so much. And we want to give um, the people that we have reading it, plenty of time to absorb everything. And, and we're still finishing some of the original writing. We still have a little bit to go. So, um, you know, fit, we'll finish in the next month or two, and then you've got to add some amount of time for people to get back to us with feedback. And then if we integrate some of their comments, um, you know, it's, it's very hard to say, but I would say by probably by, by fall or early winter would be a safe estimate. That'd be amazing. I hope there'll be an audible version. Yeah, yeah, well, we're looking into all of that. So we want to make it as widely available to people as we can. We just don't want to necessarily, you know, get into league with our corporate overlords. <laughs> it's funny because uh, there's actually a question on Audible today that I actually relate to. Since we mentioned Audible, I'll just jump into the questions. It's from Seth. He says, ever since I started to listen, ever since I started listening to books on Audible, I'm literally no longer able to sit still and read a book. Why is this and is this normal? Mm, well, it's the, this is the principle of energy conservation at work. So, you know, if we, if we have to really dial down to the, the part of the motivational triad that is most relevant for human decision-making, um, you know, this, this the motivational triad is essentially you go through life avoiding pain, seeking pleasure, and doing both with as, as little effort as possible because humans are lazy, just like all animals are lazy. So Audible, you can get, you can absorb this content for less effort. You know, you can multitask, you can do other things. It just gets fed directly into your brain. Um, and I think there are big individual differences with how people respond to that and how, um, how easily they integrate uh, audio information. I have a very difficult time if I'm, if I'm listening to an audio book. Um, so I actually don't listen to audio books very often because my mind tends to drift. I start to think about something and I, I'm off and pretty soon I've missed you know, five minutes and I, I don't know what was in the book. So um, unless it's fiction, fiction I have a little easier time kind of staying with, but I much prefer just to curl up and read old school, but that's an individual difference. So people have different brains that work very differently. Um, and if you have met uh, audiobooks and that works for your particular brain and how you like to assimilate information and it's this nice little shortcut, of course you're going to go for that. It's the same reason a lot of people listen to podcasts and YouTube videos at two or three times the speed that they, that they come out on. It's like, okay, energy conservation, I could get more for less. Um, this is the primary force that, that governs all human motivation and, and uh, behavior. So when, when in doubt, always look to what's the, what's the shortcut? <laughs> how, can I, how can I get the same thing with less effort? Yeah, because I, I do that. I do, I do speed it up, but I find I can exercise. I can walk the dog and still have the book read. So it's kind of I cool. totally can't. I get super, super distracted. So I'll listen to them like several times. If it's not something that I'm really... Um, like if it's something I just kind of want in the background uh, and, and I'm just hoping that I'm absorbing it somewhat hypnotically, <laughs> I, I will listen to things while I multitask, but not if I'm really trying to dive deep and really absorb um, complicated, nuanced information. Then I really have to read and, you know, really kind of like take notes and underline and do the whole thing. So that's, that's how I'm wired, but different people are very different. Nice. So um, normally I have to ask the questions that were submitted in advance first, but this one seems like an emergency from Adam. He says, dear Dr. Hawk, I'm waiting in the hospital for a CT scan result that will come back in an hour or so. I'm terrified and so nervous. What can I do to calm myself, please? Oh gosh, that is really tough. Yeah. Um, I mean, there's, there's really no magic answer to this. There's no technique that I can give you, you know, you know, everybody sort of wants a magic breathing meditation or something that can immediately calm you. Um, but I, you know, what I do when I'm, when I'm very anxious about anything, I've talked a lot about uh, my flight anxiety and other things is I go back to my meditation training and my, my mindfulness training. And, you know, I spent years kind of hanging out 
in, in meditation halls and doing these retreats where you basically just take yourself out of that reactive space and you, you, you kind of float above yourself a little bit. So you put yourself in what they call a lot, a lot of meditation traditions call the witness position where you were, you were watching yourself have this anxiety. So um, if you, if you can get into the space where you can just have this really limitless compassion for the fact that you are, you were really going through it right now. And there's nothing that you can do. We don't have any information. There's, there's no, um, you know, there's no particular advantage to going through all of the parameters and, and thinking about the worst case scenario right now, because you might, you might not get there. So really, this is just about sort of feeling the feelings that you're having, sitting with them, allowing them to churn because you're, you're just being taken for a ride by your nervous system right now. Um, and and just letting that process flow and, and trying to kind of separate yourself as much as you can, not in a kind of, um, you know, this is not a, you're not shutting yourself down or, or avoiding yourself. You're actually just, you're, 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 you're a lot of the, these traditions will um, use the metaphor of, you know, as if you're holding a child, like a, like a sobbing child who is really struggling and having a very hard time. You are just there for that child. You're not trying to necessarily soothe it or calm it down or anything like that. You're just like, this sucks. You're, you're really, really going through it at this moment. And um, in an hour from now, we'll be in a different space. Well, you know, the, the thing that people don't necessarily appreciate when they're in this kind of uncertainty, particularly with a, an urgent health issue, is that even if the news is very bad, the, the, what you're feeling right now will not be how you're feeling in an hour, because you, you, your brain will be able to be like, okay, so now we know where we stand. Now we know the situation. And so now we can start to marshal problem solving resources and really figure out what's the next step. It's the state of uncertainty because your nervous system does not know how to allocate time and energy. So you're just cycling around a lot of anxiety and a lot of big feelings. But that process is, is time limited. It's only going to last while you're in this waiting room waiting for the results. So, so just to sit there and be like, this is it. This is the, you know, I'm, I'm in this space for the next hour or however long it is. And that is not forever. And this too shall pass and whatever is coming my way, I will confront that squarely and fully when it happens. But until then I'm, I'm just being present for myself. That's really the, the best I can offer. I know it's not a magic, magic pill. Um, but it's, uh, it's the thing that helps me most when I'm having a lot of anxiety and, and I think gives the best perspective on that situation. Great. Thank you so much. All right, so no broadcast would be complete if we didn't get into COVID and stuff, but we're not, this is not like a, a question asking you if you're getting the vaccine, because I'm not doing that. But this yeah. is an interesting question because it's about why this has divided so many uh, vegans. So Monica says, when Dr. Esselstyn posted a photo of him getting his second vaccine on Instagram, he got hundreds of hateful comments from vegans saying things like, now I'm not going to believe anything you said before, or you're, you're obviously being paid off by the pharmaceutical industry, and many more vile comments that were hateful. I was under the impression that one of the tenets of veganism was compassion, and I don't understand why all the vegans who are against wearing masks and getting vaccinated are being so hateful. Um, I've been vegan a long time and I've never seen this kind of behavior. Can you please explain it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, you're looking at, you know, uh, Dr. Elselston is somebody who has a, a lot of followers on social media. I mean, he's, he's really, uh, you know, very visible person. He's going to attract a lot of attention. And the more people you have that are aware of you, the more you're going to see the full spectrum of human personality. <laughs> um, so, you know, when people kind of start off, if they have an Instagram or they have a Facebook account or a Twitter feed and, you know, their mom follows them and they have like five five friends that are paying attention to what they do, they're going to see uh, pretty, you know, more um, the, the, the personality that's going to be on display is going to be very similar to theirs. If they're agreeable, most of their friends are going to be agreeable. The more visibility you have um, and the bigger your audience, the more diversity of personality you're going to see in the, in the followers. And so this is a good thing and a bad thing because it's great that he has great visibility. It's great for the movement. It's, it's great for all of these things. But just because somebody is vegan doesn't mean that they are necessarily a very compassionate person or a very agreeable person. You're seeing all of the personality differences that just exist in the population become more visible the more people that are aware of, of him and of a post and, and something that is sort of a lightning rod like the vaccine process is really gonna bring all those people out of the woodwork. So I think you're just, this is, you know, 
personality 101. There are a lot of people out there that are um, very uh, aggressive and um, disagreeable on the internet. And that is just how they are. That is just how these people are. And you're more likely to run into them if you're looking at comments from somebody who has a lot of followers. It's just that it's sort of the internet rewards that sort of behavior. And that's one of the many reasons that I always have my comments closed <laughs> on almost everything that I post. So um, yeah, in, in COVID in particular and vaccines, this is, this is a signal that people are making to, uh, it's an it's a intra-tribal signal. So, so people who are um, you know, making these posts on something like an Instagram photo that Dr. Esselstyn posts, they, they are really trying to signal to their tribe, hey, I'm one of you. You should you should coalesce around me because I believe very strongly in my way of doing things. It's it's very much this human tendency to to kind of set up a little soapbox and, and grandstand about who it is that we are. Um, and we always have had this in, in human nature, and now we see it really amplified in social media. Um, and so you know there are a lot of reasons to avoid social media, and that's uh, that's one of them. If you if you find yourself bothered by it. Um, I, I have a, a wonderful extension that I use um, on my on my computer called Shut Up, <laughs> which automatically blocks comments on every website. So it just detects whether there's a comment field on YouTube or on Instagram or anything, um, and you just never even see it. You just never even see the comment comment field. And it really made me aware that um, you know when I go to a YouTube video, even if it's not my own, I very quickly start to look up comments even before I finished consuming the content directly. I'm looking at the comments to kind of figure out, okay, what does the village think of this person? What's the conversation going on here? And once I, once I started the shut up extension, I realized how much that was interfering with my actual interpretation and judgment of the context uh, of the content on its own merits. I was, I was having a reaction to it and I had an opinion about it, but not until I sort of looked at what other people were saying. And so confronting that that was happening, even for somebody like me who considers myself very independent, very, you know, like I'm, I'm going to form my own opinion no matter what other people think. It was an interesting check on that belief because I, I was a little, um, you know, I was checking in with the village before I really determined what it is that I thought. So uh, just something for people to use. I, I think it works. I know it works with um, Safari, but it might work with other browsers too. Wow, that, so it's called Shut Up. Shut up. <laughs> it's a little talk balloon with an exclamation point. <laughs> and there are probably other other extensions um, that people can use. I'm sure it's not the only one. But like, I don't get why people want to know if Dr. X or Dr. Y is getting the vaccine, because if I mean, listen, I love Dr. Greger, but I'm not going to make my decision because he gets it. And I also love certain other doctors that aren't getting it, but I'm not going to not get. Do you know what I'm trying to say? Like, don't people think for themselves anymore? Yeah, I think a lot of that has to do with the lack of, um, you know, we, we are no longer in an environment where, you know, the, the metaphor I'll always use is we don't have Walter Cronkite anymore. <laughs> there's no sort of like, the, there's no universality around, you know, what what's the right thing to do. Um, and so people are subject to all of these competing streams of information. And I, you know, I have ranted about this at length and I, I can again if people are interested, but you, you really need to understand that you are living in a, a in an individual information bubble that algorithms that you cannot understand or control are are creating for you so everything that you do on the internet is contributing to what kind of information you see so so if you were interested in something and you click on it that is in that is increasing the little the, the avatar that exists of you that that okay this person likes this information and that motivated them to take action and click and retweet and do this and so we're going to give them more of that. So it becomes an echo chamber. We live in these little echo chambers of information um, where all in, and all of this is very apolitical. It's not like you have people at Facebook and Twitter saying, you know, what, how, how can we move opinion in a certain direction? All they want to do is sell you more ads. And so they're very interested in what you're interested in. And so they pay very close attention to what you're interested in and what motivates you to, um, to click a like button or, or, or even better gets you upset. So, you know, gets you to write a nasty comment or, or gets you to um, retweet with a comment or anything like that. This is all information to construct a better um, idea of who it is that you are and what motivates you to spend more time with more eyeballs on the screen and therefore buy more advertising. Um, and so that's the whole game. That's, that's just what's going on. And so people are, 
very individual in their information environment and they have overlap with other people, but they don't appreciate the fact that, that, that it's very, it's really this unique environment unto themselves. And there's no overarching, this is the thing to do, this is not the thing to do. And so you have these, these sort of divisions that are cropping up over everything, including vaccines, including all things COVID, including, I mean, we could talk veganism, we could talk about any topic that, you know, it, it's, if you do research on the internet, you're going to find evidence to support your point of view um, and and people get very they get their status all wrapped up in that where they, they they post something about oh I found this article on this source that says I should or shouldn't get a vaccine and that's you know this is this is information I'm sharing with the Stone Age village now they have some status in the game now they're less likely to change their opinion in the face of, of um, contradictory evidence because they've taken a stand. They've, they've stood in front of their peers and said, I'm sharing this information because this is what I believe is true. So we actually have really good research to show that people um, you know, are, are it's, it's very, it's a high cost walk back. If you share something to then say, oh, you know what? I saw, I found another article and that thing that I posted two days ago is BS. And so forget that, you know, go with this. Nobody does that. People get all dug in, they get all status associated with their opinions. Um, and so you have, you have just this, this diversity of viewpoints, um, again, which is not totally a bad thing. It's, it's great that people are, are able to pursue all of these different, different avenues and get information from so many different places, but it creates this informational chaos. So they're, they're looking to people that they admire to kind of help them triangulate because there, there's so much noise, there's no clear decision, there's no, it's not, it's not obvious what to do. People have a lot of doubts, no matter how committed they are to anything. And so if Alpha makes a decision to do it, that that lets us feel a little better about you know our course of action. We can we can say, hey, you know, Alpha in the Stone Age Village says it's okay, says this is the way to do it. Um, and so that's how that's my course of action, despite all of this contradictory information that I'm looking at. We're, we're very beholden to that kind of leadership because again, in our ancestral history for, for countless generations, it was actually really important to do what Alpha said because otherwise you might wind up dead. Um, Alpha became Alpha because the village determined that that was the person who had the most authority, who had the, the best ability to look at a bunch of different things and come to the best conclusion for everybody's well-being in the village. Um, and if you didn't step into line and do what Alpha wanted you to do, uh, you could wind up dead, you could wind up hurt, you could wind up getting banished, all kinds of things that are gonna get filtered out of the gene pool as we go generation by generation. So, so we do have this tendency to want to follow strong charismatic authority that's that's not a that's not a bug in human nature it's a feature wow but the thing is is to me dr russelson's an icon and e even if you don't agree with the vaccine it doesn't negate all his whole life of work you know what i'm saying i mean to me that's just ridiculous yeah of course i mean and this is this is a, you know again part of what just emerges when you get into this chaotic information environment we suddenly are judging people on these really thin slices of their of their beliefs or their behavior or something that they did 20 years ago or anything else, rather than taking the totality of their work and um, everything that they have to contribute and judging it for ourselves and taking what works and leaving the rest. Yeah. Well, speaking of social media, there's a question from Joel. Why is it that so many of the younger Johnny come lately plant-based doctors are more interested in being social media stars than practicing medicine? <laughs> Oh, well, because everybody in principle is interested in, in the increased status that would come with being a social media star. So I think part of the answer for that is the, the Johnny come lately's are just more social media savvy. So this is, this is a tool that everybody in principle has available to them, but you know, up and comers are, and they've, they've grown up with the internet that this is more, this is like, they're just, this is the water that they swim in. And so it's very easy for them to start a TikTok and kind of, you know, create a bunch of content. Whereas that's not something you would ever see John McDougal do because it's just not part of his experience and part of how he knows how to communicate his ideas. Um, you know, we could ask the same thing if we were to dial back the clock and go back to 1984 and be like, what is with all these young upstart vegan doctors like Dean Ornish and, and John McDougal that, that keep doing interviews on, um, you know, talk shows. Like, oh, they just want to be stars because they're going on talk shows. They are, they're leveraging the best possible way to get their message out. And that's the most natural way that they know how to do it. And it's intersecting with this sort of general desire that most, most humans have to acquire a little bit of fame or notoriety because 
because it increases our status. We are very status driven. Doesn't mean that everybody necessarily wants to be famous, but everybody does want to have signals from the Stone Age village that they are valued. Um, and for most people, if we're just kind of going to look at a bell curve of the population, most people, the more followers they have, the more attention they get, the more successful they are on social media, that's a very powerful proxy for being valued by the Stone Age village. So there's nothing pathological about it necessarily. I think it's the intersection between where te technology is, how comfortable people are with it, and just general tendencies toward accumulating status. Wow, that's interesting. Yeah, because I mean, the, the doctors that I go to, none of them are on social media. Like, the, yeah. The, I don't want to say yeah. the real doctors like that those are, but like, I just don't see how a doctor has time, like at least, you know, to be on them all the time. Anyway, okay, so here's a question that Angie sent in. My husband and I were fortunate enough to be able to retire early. So two years ago, we moved to a warmer climate into an active 55 and older community. We've been here almost three years and love everything about it, except that we really haven't made any friends. I understand that last year there's been a pandemic, but I don't know why we didn't forge any meaningful friendships the first two years we're here. We are both more extroverted than introverted, athletic and social people, and had many friends and acquaintances where we lived the first 58 years of our lives. I know Dr. Lyle has once said that friends or insurance policies, but we really don't need friends for that reason because we're very financially stable, but we'd like to have a few. Is it just harder to make friends when you're in your 60s and when you're vegan? Yeah, it, I think it's generally harder to, to make friends as you go through life. You know, none of us um, kind of has the naivete that we had in kindergarten when everybody was our friend. Uh, the insurance policy metaphor is very accurate. So just in case people haven't heard that, I'll, I'll go over that really quickly. So friendship really is it's Stone Age insurance. You, you invest in a friendship process with somebody else because there's sort of this implication that, okay, if things really hit the fan at some point in the future, you're gonna be there for me. You're gonna, you're gonna help me out when we're out on a hunt and I break my leg, you're gonna help me get back to the village. You're not gonna abandon me to be eaten by bears. Um, and so this is, this is a reciprocal dynamic because you want friends who you're perceiving are going to be a good bet that are, that are worth the premium that you're investing in them in terms of time and energy that are gonna pay off. But your friends also want that from you. So, so I would, you know, I, I'm, I, I would be curious about a lot of things about this dynamic. I'm like, how many people have you met? Um, under what circumstances are you meeting them? What are those conversations looking like? Um, you know, the, the people are, are, are looking for the same thing that you're looking for. They're looking for sort of an easy connection that's not asking a lot of them socially um, and that you have character and resources that are gonna be available to them um, if things uh, get, get problematic. So that, that plus the whole drift that humans experience over the course of their lifetime where we get more discerning about who we want to spend time with. I mean, when you're, when you're a kid, when you're, one of the reasons it's so easy to make friends with, when you're a kid is you haven't developed many correlations of what people are like. So you haven't met enough people, you haven't had enough experience to be like, okay, if I observe this trait in somebody that is likely to to uh, manifest in a particular kind of behavior later on. So, you know, somebody is kind of uh, in a bad mood all the time. It means that they might be prone to rages. That's a, that's a correlation that we develop over time in our, in our lifetime with increased experience, increased um, friends, friends that we've sort of had and lost and moved on from. But when you're a kid, you don't have that. Everybody seems like they could be your friend. As we get older, we get much more discerning about who we spend our time with because that's our time and energy. That's the only resource. That also, we, we got a lot of it. We got a lot of it, a lot less of it left. Right, exactly. And so we should be more discerning about it. So often this takes, you know, I have a lot of people who will who will tell me that they're worried that they're getting to um, self isolating and that 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 is somehow a problem, you know, people, therapists or someone else has told them that it's an issue for them to be self isolating, they need to get out more. But I think a lot of people become more introverted with age, because they're they're just running the cost benefit analysis on any potential relationship. Being, I don't know if it's worth it. I don't know if I, I don't know if I need that. I don't know if it's worth my time and energy, my limited time and energy um, to invest in that relationship. So you're, you're, you're working against all of those tendencies and, and people running a pretty hard cost benefit analysis on you a lot of the time. And you, you have a little bit of distortion because you're extroverted and you're gregarious and it's, it's, you know, you're not taking these relationships uh, as seriously as somebody who's introverted. Well, an introverted person has less bandwidth for friendship. So they're only going to want to make friends with people who are really good reciprocal policy. An extrovert 
introvert can have a lot of friends that are pretty more superficial, essentially. So you you have kind of differing levels of um, of value that you're bringing into that exchange. And so if if you if you're like super extroverted, way off on the bell curve, and you're running into most people that you're running into are less extroverted than you are, it's just going to be a harder trade. So that's where Dr. Lyle and I will always use the phrase, which is very non-vegan. So we need a better phrase. If anyone has one, let me know. But fish where the fish are. Um, so you know this is really kind of a numbers game. It's a numbers game with friendship. It's a numbers game with romance. It's a numbers game with job applications. Uh, if you're not finding what you're looking for, you just need to kind of put yourself in front of more potential options that are going to recognize what you're offering and, and that it's a good trade. Okay, we'll have to think of, you know, it's interesting. There's uh, so many sayings are animal sayings, mm -hmm. you know, and yeah, it's they are. vegan and that, and, 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 cause they're not very vegan friendly, like uh, more than one way to skin a cat, kill two birds with one stone. I wish we could get that out of the language. I mean, I'm wondering even how those sayings even started cause they're not very favorable to animals. Yeah, well, as a species, we're not the most animal friendly species <laughs> out there. So I think a lot of them just emerged from our a very exploitative relationship with animals throughout most of our ancestral history. But yeah, I agree. I know that there are substitutions for some, but uh, fish where the fish are, I've never heard a good one. So I'm open to it, though. Yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna start thinking about that. So <laughs> I posted on the fans of the Beat Your Jeans podcast Facebook page, if, if there, we only had four emailed in questions. So I'm gonna go there first. I'm going to go with their second, actually. And um, the question that got the most, just like on your uh, your website, now you're having people vote. Uh, there were three questions about weight loss. So I'm going to go to that one first. Well, actually, about your weight loss from different people. So I'll read them all because then you can talk about it all at once. So basically, Leah, in general, said, I would like Dr. Hawk to talk about her weight loss journey. And then Meredith said, when you look back at your weight loss journey, what are the three things you wish you had known when you started out? What are things you focused on in the beginning that were time journey wasters? And then it may be even more specific. Anne says, I would like to know about how weight loss affects your interaction with people, specifically men. Do you find the attention uncomfortable when you're no longer just in the friend zone with men? When I lost weight, since gained it all back, I felt uncomfortable and almost vulnerable when I would get attention from men. You can feel someone looking at you in public and on one hand, it feels awesome. On the other, it's uncomfortable. Maybe because evolutionarily, you're opening yourself up for more male pursuers, which could lead to dangerous situations. So take it away. Mm -hmm. no. Yeah, a lot of interesting questions. Um, I would say at the at the risk of, of plugging um, a product, <laughs> uh, if people really want to hear my my story, I talk about that in the webinar that I did that you can get the replay, the recorded replay on my website, the review and renew series. So um, I talk a little bit about the my, my experience and the history and what, what took me there and um, all of that. But yeah, it's, um, you know, three things that I, I wish I had known. Let me think about what those would be. The first would definitely be that it takes a lot longer than you think it's going to take. It's a much slower process than most most people have been led culturally to believe that it is. We sort of all grow up reading these magazines and hearing again and again that something like 10 pounds a month is a achievable and normal standard of weight loss for most people. And that is, that's crazy, that's crazy. People who are, are starting off and have a lot of weight to lose, that may be true initially, um, but for most people who have, you know, under a hundred pounds to lose, you're looking much more at something like five pounds a month. Five pounds a month is actually a very good rate of weight loss. You know, it's more than a pound a week. I would say anything between two and five pounds a month is really good. Um, and the closer you get to your goal, the slower it's going to be. The only way to change that is to be eating basically under the hunger drive or eating a, a for a lot of people, a diet that is so uh, calorie dilute that it's not going to be sustainable over time. So it's not that it's not it's not um, successful to to eat a very low calorie density diet, but that's not going to be a sustainable equilibrium for every person for the rest of their life. So you can lose weight more quickly if you really dial down the calorie density of something of, of your of your daily diet. Um, but if that if you're feeling hungry all the time, you're feeling unsatisfied, it's not sustainable. Your nervous system is going to retaliate and you're going to yo-yo if that's the case. So what you really need to do is get to um, find, find where the equilibrium of calorie density is for you to lose about a pound a week or half a pound a week, somewhere in that range, and just stick there. Don't, don't take any calorie density away until you absolutely have to. You have to come to terms with the fact that this is gonna be a glacial 
initially slow process and that it's not linear. So I guess that would be number two of, uh, you know, following on number one, it's really slow and it's not linear. So you're going to have moments, you're going to have ups and downs. Um, you're going to have plateaus where you're not losing for a long time, even eating exactly the same food, even, even, you know, being as diligent as you are, which most people are not. So most people, a lot of the ups and downs are just the vicissitudes of living your life and trying to do your best on an ongoing basis. There are times where you're going to be more compliant and times where you're not. Um, and I talk about this a lot in that, in that webinar that people can listen to. Um, and so, sort of how to habituate to that expectation that this is a journey, this is a lifelong journey. You don't beat the pleasure track. You don't just defeat the pleasure trap and be one and done. And, and it's, that's, that's it. You never have to think about it again. It's really about managing it. It's about creating a life that has really good protections and structures to, to help you make the best decision more times than not. Um, that's really what people should be aiming toward. Not Certainly not perfection and certainly not this transcendent idea that you're going to beat the pleasure trap and be done forever and transformed and happily ever after and unicorns and sparkles for the rest of your life. It's just really not the case for most people. Um, and then a third thing, um, I don't know what a third thing will be. Maybe, maybe it'll occur to me, um, but yeah, slow, uneven. Um, and I relatedly, uh, you know, just be eating to satiety. Don't try to eat under the hunger drive. Like people, I, I've done it too. I understand that it's tempting um, because you see quicker results. And so you think when you're in it, you think you can pull it off. You think you can sustain it forever. It feels easy when you're in it and you're, you're losing two pounds a week and you're feeling like, oh, hey, I've got this, like no problem. But you know, and your nervous system knows that you're actually eating under the hunger drive and that it's going to catch up with you. And it's, it's going to, it's going to come back. It's going to catch you. Um, you cannot outrun these exquisitely exquisitely adapted and evolved satiety mechanisms. You have to work with them and accept that it's just gonna take time. Nice. Hey, you know, Reeves came up with the saying, She's, uh, we were saying- Oh, uh, of course Reeves did. Can count on Reeves uh, for these things. <laughs> uh, pick flowers where the, fl uh, where the flowers are. Yeah, well, that's very Pick vegetables sweet. where the gardens are. That's yeah, oh, good, good, good. Okay, well, we'll try. I'll try to like move our lexicon in that direction, we'll see. <laughs> so yeah. Mandy said, I love Dr. Hawk. I wish I could talk to her every day. You probably can just book. She, she does private consults. I mean, if she's got an appointment open, she'll talk to you for sure. I do. I do. And, you know, I'm, I'm sort of moving toward, I've got the village every week and um, I'm, I'm sort of, I'm, I'm at some point in the very near future, starting sort of another weekly, weekly show that's going to be happening for people who are more interested in kind of political, cultural things. Um, so yeah, there's, there's lots going on. You can definitely, definitely uh, keep up with me. Yeah. Um, this is interesting. Carolyn made a comment because I was thinking of the question from Angie, because I didn't make a lot of friends since moving here. And everybody said, oh, you're going to be so popular. Like nobody knows I can't get arrested in the desert. I had so many friends in L.A. But she said, is the reason people have fewer close friendships today all due to social media filling that void? I, ha I don't have friends on social media. I hate social media. I don't even do it. Yeah, I don't think so. I think there's a strong drive in human nature to have connections with other people. In fact, I hear from clients all the time that they, they, you know, that social media does not fill the void, that they can have as many Facebook friends as, as they want, hundreds and hundreds, but if they don't have one or two really good friends, um, that's still a real void and a real absence in their life. So, um, you know, there may be some individuals for whom spending social media time detracts from time that they might otherwise be picking flowers where the flowers are <laughs> um, and, and a little bit sort of getting, um, getting seduced by the idea that these are real friendships. We, we call that pseudo esteem. The idea that the, you know, the more Instagram followers you have, you have these friends. These aren't your friends. They don't know, they don't know you. They haven't run a cost benefit analysis on a, a stone age insurance policy like you do in a real life friendship. Um, so there is a little bit of a susceptibility to feeling that kind of like, oh, I, I have a lot of people in my corner uh, when you actually don't. But I think people really, you know, the, the sort of the average for the species is one or two really good friends, one or two people who are really going to be there for you, who you would, you would, um, you know, drive across the state in the middle of the night to go rescue from some terrible situation. That's really what we need in our life. We don't need more than that. Most, most people, people who are very, very extroverted need sort of um, to feel like they're more of a crowd with le that less intensity of the friendship. But I think average bell curve, most humans, one, one or two really good friends um, sat satisfies that impulse. 
with one or two really good dogs. Well, yeah, <laughs> the best dogs in the universe, you know, really just blows it out of the water. I know that's the best. Wow. And uh, Teresa <laughs> says, are there good evolutionary psychology books to read on women's issues? There's a couple. I mean, it depends what you mean by women's issues. So um, we have a full reading list on the beatyourgenes.org. Uh, I think it's .org. I always forget. I think it's beatyourgenes.org um, is the website for our podcast. Um, and uh, there's a there's a link to our reading list, which is, you know, all, all the books, or at least most of the books that we have mentioned on any podcast are listed there, They're not really organized by topic. But there's definitely a few, um, you know, about beauty and um uh, David Buss talks about sort of female sexuality a little bit. Uh, there's some, but there's not, there's not sort of like a women's handbook to evolutionary psychology. I wish there were. Maybe I'll, I'll get around to writing that someday after we finish this one. Yeah, I was going to say, well, why don't you write it, you know? <laughs> you know I, I, she's not watching today, but I wish she was. So my, my, don't you think that, see, I don't, I, I'm sure you saw Social Dilemma, right? Oh, oh, yes. Yeah. And that made me even more convinced about how much I hate it. And I've, I've been off it for a long time. I mean, yes, there's posts made, but, but I don't, I've never even had a friend page on Facebook. That's how much I hate it. Mm -hmm. And yet and my friend Sharon is on it all the time. And she could be doing something in life, like writing a book or, or whatever. And she says, oh, but because of the pandemic, it's the only way to interact. But like every time I do go on, which is willfully once in a while, it's not even on my phone anymore. It's like, she's liked everything. She's seen everything. And it's like, it just seems like so many people are living their life on social media and not living it in the real world anymore. Yeah, I think there's definitely some truth to that. Um, and this is because social media is a super normal stimulant, like, like, like the pleasure trap food is or like alcohol or caffeine is. I mean, this is, it's, it's, it's hijacking pathways in the brain that are making stone age inferences about how successful you are, how much status you have, how many friends you have. All of those things are, are getting, there's like social media is a little proxy and it's, it's filling that gap and it's sending you signals that what you're doing is the right thing when in fact it's the wrong thing. And in a lot of cases, maybe a very self-defeating thing because the more time for, for some people, not for everybody, but for some people, it's a zero sum um, prospect where the more time you spend online, the more time you're spending on Facebook, liking things, the less time you're spending um, you know, picking carrots in the vegetable garden. Um, so it's like, I'm gonna have to, I gotta have to workshop this Reeves. I'm not quite there yet. Um, but that, that, I don't think everybody necessarily has that sort of like, it's, it's, you know, I'm, I'm losing more time for social processes if I'm spending them online, but for a lot of people, they are. And certainly for everybody, even if you think you're above it, you're not above it. So, so um, Tristan Harris, who is the, the writer, director, star of The Social Dilemma, um, the, the former Google employee who narrates most of it. If people haven't seen that documentary, they, they really should because it's gonna change your relationship with social media for sure. Um, he calls this the race to the bottom of the brainstem. That's kind of his, his, his tagline. And I think it's very effective, very, very you know, vivid, um, where you, you just don't even recognize all of the ways that you, your, your motivation and your willpower and your interest has been hijacked. So there are like so many things going on with social media that get me all riled up. So people need to understand that these, these tools were built literally by the same people that designed Las Vegas, that designed slot machines. Um, and so the example I always wanna remind people of, if you're scrolling through Instagram, you're, you're going like this, right? You're, you're pulling down on your notifications, you're waiting for another thing to pop up. That is a slot machine. You have this kind of uncertainty about, oh, is it gonna be cherries? Is it gonna be bananas? Is it gonna be an ad? Is it gonna be something good? Is it gonna be something exciting? And even the little pause that is built into it while it loads the next thing, that's actually by design. That's to keep you hooked in a little more because it's not like the, the software needs the lag. It could, it, could, it could load these things immediately, but by forcing you to kind of sit there and build anticipation, it actually builds a stronger connection in your brain to get more addicted to it. Um, the little red flags that appear next to all the notifications and all the apps, that's very much like red is a big evolutionary color. It's danger and it's excitement and it's food and it's sex and it's all of these things. We're very, very um, beholden to the color red. Um, so it's no accident that the notification flag is red. It's no accident that it makes these particular little noises. All of these things are, are really, really well-designed and now not just well-designed, but they have been triangulated with algorithmic evidence because they have uh, hundreds of thousands of users who are very similar to you, have very similar usage patterns to you and they behaved in this way, which makes it very much more predictive about what's gonna motivate you, how you're gonna behave. That technology just gets more nuanced by the day. 
Um, and so people, it's, it's the addictive process of social media. The fact that you're not necessarily using your time and energy like you might like to be using it. And it's the fact that you're feeding into this um, misinformation, polarizing, hyper individualized information environment that is actually, in my view, as a political scientist, um, detrimental to, to a robust democracy. I think it's actually the biggest danger to the democratic process. Um, and I, like, I, I would have thought that that was alarmist to say just a couple of years ago, but at this point, I'm, I, I think it is the biggest danger that we're facing. Uh, so those two things together are, are enough to really get you to take social media um, behavior and your the role that it plays in your life very seriously and to really try to pull back. Yeah, even when I was on it, I never had my notifications turned on. So I'd actually have to like go there to look. I, and, and I don't even have notifications on my phone with the exception of my husband. If he were to call or text, I get a ding. I, I never even know if I get yeah. it. I, I just don't I mean, want Busy. Yeah, yeah, this is, you know, one of the most common things that people will say when you when I go on these rants, or when anybody does is, okay, so what do I do about it? You know, I'm not going to give up social media, I'm not going to throw my phone away. So there are things you can do to improve your existence and not completely delete all these accounts. So one of them is to turn your notifications off. So, um, you know, different phones, there, there are actually instructions for how to do this on the, um, uh, the, the Center for Humane Technology, which is Harris's and a few other people put this foundation together to try to solve this problem. So if you go to their website, um, there are some suggestions and instructions for how to do things. So turn off your notifications. You can also, if you have an iPhone, I don't know about Android, but iPhone, you can go into the settings and um, make everything black and white, which is really interesting. So, so I've dabbled around with this. When you, you take color away from social media, it's much less interesting, not just because of the notifications, but just all of it, just the super normal quality of it. Um, it really diminishes, it makes it much less interesting. You, there are apps that can, um, well, the iPhone itself has built-in usage metrics. So you can you can tell your iPhone, limit my social media time to X amount of time a day, um, and then give me a little warning that you've gone over it. So it can do that. There are also plenty of apps that you can install on your phone and elsewhere that uh, can kind of force you into this sort of compliance. They, they're they working on some things that are even trickier and work against the sort of um, the race to the bottom of the brainstem where it, it downgrades the speed, like the loading speed of, of these pages, just almost imperceptibly over a certain amount of time, which basically changes your cost benefit analysis on wanting to spend time doing it. And you don't even notice that it's happening. It's really, really, really subtle, but in the same kind of way that the lag gets you um, all excited, this is enough of a lag that you actually are like, ah, screw this, it's not worth it. So they're, they're triangulating on ways to make people's lives better who can't or won't quit social media entirely. Um, and I totally understand. I mean, this is, this is a really difficult trap to escape and there are, benefits. There are certainly benefits. Like I, I have an Instagram account. I post on it. I, I have, I've made good connections on Instagram and on Twitter. Um, I like the information that I'm able to get in these places that I wouldn't necessarily be able to get elsewhere. So it's not that it's all evil and terrible. It's just mostly evil and terrible. <laughs> kind of like nuclear power. It's how you use it, huh? Uh, yeah, I, yeah, you could, I could say that. I think, I think nuclear power is a better prospect for humanity's future than social media is. Yeah, I, I agree. So <laughs> there's another question from the fans of the Beat Your Jeans podcast. That's a private group on Facebook. If anybody wants to join where, where the discussion of the podcast happens often. And this is from Kiki. Is there an evolutionary advantage or disadvantage to being an only child? Oh, that's a really interesting question. Yeah, I, I don't know offhand. I'm sure there's research about this. So we had um, in the virtual village last night, somebody was asking about birth order and, and what birth order means for personality or if there's certain personality characteristics that are more likely um, that we're gonna see in older children versus younger children. Most of that research has been debunked. So, so it doesn't, birth order doesn't really matter too much. Um, so, I, I, but I'm not sure if anybody's really looked at the only children question. I would look at Judith Rich Harris's book um, about birth order and, and um, sort of uh, sibling relationships. And, uh, you know, she addresses some of those questions. I can't remember the name of it offhand, but I think we link or we have a, we have the name of it on the Beat Your Genes page. Um, and she, you know, she is giving more weight to birth order than uh, subsequent research has turned up, but she might deal with only, only child questions, at least in a way that you could go 
look at the footnotes and kind of see what other research she's citing and, and see where that can take you. Um, I would be surprised if David Buss has not looked at this as well. So, but I don't know offhand, I'm not familiar with that literature. So we can, we can uh, put that in the category for our next um, member chat. I think uh, Dr. Lyle and I are having a member chat for the Living Wisdom Library for people who are members um, this Thursday. So I know you're uh, having it at 11 o'clock when I can't make it. I, I know. I, I know I felt I, I tried to negotiate the time with him and that was just the only time he could do it he and I are always working with like time zone differences and we have busy schedules and so I'm like no that's AJ's time I, I knew you were gonna I knew it it's it so funny it's like I got 23 other up but that's okay I'll watch the replay so Lou from the fans of the beat your jeans podcast group says if social and economic status discrepancies generally make us happy when we're the superior party then why do we tend to prefer to mix with people of our own social class is that even true i don't know oh yeah that's very true you you uh your friendship your romance your your associative tendencies are all sort of within a certain um, tolerance limit with with SES and also with IQ and sort of other other cues that we have from um, people that we spend time with. So I think you, it, this is a relative question. This is sort of like you you want to you, it, it doesn't it doesn't make a huge amount of difference to feel superior to somebody who's three degrees you know a couple standard deviations uh, less successful than you are because it's just the the division is too great. It doesn't confer any really good status signals on you. That's not really your competitive field. You want to have, it's keeping up with the Joneses. It's your neighbor next door who makes a similar salary, who uh, has a, his wife is similarly attractive. You, you have a similar sized house and lawn. That's the person you're really competing with. That's your competitive field. So it's the, it's the signals of, um, of success and, and value that you're getting from the village relative to how competitive you are with people that we could reasonably expect you to be competitive with. Uh, it doesn't mean that you can't be happy unless you're the best, unless you're the most successful, unless you're the richest, obviously that's not true. Um, but you, you're you probably not gonna be happy if you're looking around at your competitive feel, field um, of people that you would reasonably feel on a similar playing field with and that you're the absolute bottom of the heap on every dimension. If that's the case, you're likely to have feelings of depression. You're likely to, to not feel very good about yourself. You're gonna get bad esteem, bad failure feedback about your success in life. Um, and that is why we have those emotions. Those emotions are a barometer of basically how, how competitively successful you are in the domain that we would expect you to be competitively successful relative to the amount of effort that you've put into it. So that's not going to travel across the entire spectrum of, of um, human capacity and human talents and, and, and ability. You're, you're going to be judging yourself uh, along the same kind of metric that people who are very similar are going to be judged. Nice. Do you have time for one more question, Dr. Hopp? Sure, sure. Okay, great. This is also from the fans of the Beat Your Jeans podcast group. Robin says, can you talk about re-entering social life in person after being so separated for pe from people? I feel so guarded and it feels a bit awkward. I'm an extrovert. You know what I love about this pandemic? If, I mean, I don't love the idea of the pandemic or people dying, obviously, or losing their jobs, but I never realized how much of a true introvert I was because I could go on like this forever. <laughs> I mean, except yeah. for all the death and, you know, you know, I'm not talking about that part, but, you know, this idea of just getting to stay yeah. home all the time. I mean, this has been fantastic for my nervous system. Yeah, this is, uh, we talked about this last night on the virtual village too. I'm, I'm hearing more and more that people are kind of having this anxiety about re-entry and also some anxiety about losing the COVID way of life, which is actually a, a pretty good situation for a lot of people. For a lot of people, um, you know, I wrote very early in, in the COVID developments, uh, an essay that's still on my website called Of Personalities and Pandemics, which is really all about how your personality is filtering your experience of the world in every way, including your experience of something like a, like a pandemic disaster. Um, and so people who are on balance, more introverted, um, more emotionally unstable, more, I mean, we could, we could sort of more disagreeable. <laughs> we, could, we could name a lot of different things that, you know, controlling for all other factors have these sorts of traits you know, lockdown life is going to suit them better than it might suit other people. Of course, we have to account for what they do for the, for a living and everything else. But there are a lot of people, there's a, there's a non, you know, a, a non-trivial number of people in this country who have um, benefited from the lockdown status quo in, in terms of how 
uh, you know, what their competitive day-to-day -day really looks like. They're, they're sort of, we live in these little pods of, of Zoom and um, managing our own time where there's a lot of control over impression management. And impression management is essential to human happiness when it comes for what kind of status we're getting from the village. And so, you know, it's a much riskier proposition to go to the office and meet people. You don't even know, you don't know what's gonna happen that day. You don't know who you're gonna meet. You don't know who's gonna, you know, what's gonna happen in the meeting. You don't, there are a lot of unknowns. It's more competitive stress um, than sitting at home and being able to have a lot of control over when you're on and when you're off. Um, you know, what kind of food you're getting ordered and what kind you aren't. Like all of these things have become, people have become really habituated. Um, and, and people are really habituated to uh, feeling safer and feeling uh, more protected from contagion and all of these things. These are, these are powerful incentives that now exist at the population level. And so it's gonna be very interesting to see how these evolve over the next couple of months. Um, and I think my feeling, we'll, we'll see. Um, my feeling is that, uh, you know, we are very good at habituating to new circumstances. Look at how, you know, crazy and unheard of something like uh, quarantine and lockdown was when it first began and then how sort of normalized it has become in not that much time and to the point where now we have anxiety about going back to the old way. So um, I think we will see sort of re-entry proceed in stages with a lot of personality differences along the way, but we will, we will basically rehabituate, recalibrate um, to reality as it is, no matter what that reality looks like. We're very adaptive in that way. So. Um, yeah, I, I, it's, you're, you're in the same boat as a lot of people. A lot of people are worried about interacting and having normal conversations again. So it's not, not just you. But don't you think some of this will continue? Like, I mean, I, I know Dr. McDougall said, you know, he put his program online out of necessity, but now he says he'll never go back to doing, I don't, you know, I don't know if that, that's true, but he makes it seem like he, he would prefer to keep doing it this way. So do you think a lot of this online education interacting will still continue even when things get back to whatever normal means? Oh, I'm sure. I'm sure. It's difficult to imagine, you know, the sort of, um, I'm, I'm a political scientist and I'm looking at the, every fall we have this American Political Science Association conference and it's a hybrid conference this year. And I think that will continue to be the case because you just are going to have a lot of people who wouldn't otherwise be particularly excited about flying across the country to go present a paper. And they're not, they're not particularly extroverted. They don't really enjoy the process. Um, you know, all of the sort of gratuitous travel that people were doing for work um, is, I think you're gonna see that much curtailed because it's, it's been proven unnecessary. Um, a lot more remote jobs being, being sort of normalized, being uh, made permanent. I, I, I think a lot of that's gonna happen. So yeah, we'll just see where we wind up. There's going to be a, another sort of tide of, uh, you know, a lot of the extroverts who have this sort of pent up demand. <laughs> you're gonna have a little bit of a roaring twenties effect too when, when we do get back to any kind of um, normal social behavior where people are allowed to congregate and, and um, get their party on. I think you're gonna see the extroverts finally meeting that demand, but definitely not for everybody. Why don't they all just go together in some area? Because you know, I can reach so many more people online. Even when I was doing night conferences, I've done 19 of them. I mean, the most I ever got was like five or 600 people. But when you do things online, it's like you could reach the whole world. Yeah, I think something like I was thinking about the American Political Science Association, just because that's my, that's sort of my annual thing. I'll, I mean, nobody's going to say this out loud, but the reason that most people want to go to that conference is it's, it's a meat market. It's people, there's a lot of sort of like, socializing, but it's a very specific kind of socializing. And so it's sort of a, it's this outlet for people to drink a lot, hang out with their, their old friends from grad school, have some hookups, all of these kind of things that characterize academic conferences. Obviously not everybody, obviously that's not all that's happening at academic conferences, but that's a lot of what's happening. Um, and so that, that tendency, that desire in human nature is not going anywhere. So I think you will see a hybrid model and it's just going to sort itself out according to personality and to innate interest. People who are not going to that conference to necessarily find a hookup are gonna be very happy to sit at home and present their paper remotely. Um, people who had ulterior motives for going in the first place are gonna be like, when are we getting back in person? <laughs> I gotta get to my favorite bar. Yeah, that's, that's going to be interesting. Well, thank you so much. It's always so much fun talking to you. Thank you guys for your great questions. We'll try to get Dr. Hawk back as soon as her schedule allows, either by herself or with Dr. Lyle. We do have Dr. Lyle coming up on March 21st, which is the first day of the new season, meaning I've done the shows for a year and he's coming on with Dr. Goldhammer this time. 
Oh boy, Tru double trouble. Exactly. Should be a good time. Exactly. <laughs> so thank you so much. It's great to see you always. And thanks all always. of you for watching another episode of Chef AJ Live. Please come back tomorrow because my guest is another heavy hitter, none other than Dr. John McDougall. Take care, Dr. Hawk. Bye-bye. Thank you so much. See you soon. Bye.